All right. Uh, prelude to uh, Jersey Pine Baron's most feared legendary character. The Jersey Devil. Now, where did the Jersey Devil come from? Well, the legend was a woman named uh, Mother Leeds who had 12 children. When she found out she was pregnant again with her 13th, she damned that 13th child. Let this one be the devil. At birth, he changed into a creature with hooves, head of a goat. Uh, sometimes he has a head of a horse, talons, fork tail, bat wings. And he haunts the swamps and bogs of the Pinelands, terrorizing both inhabitants and travelers. All right, however, this mythic creature does not hold a candle to real life individuals depicted as pine robbers. The Jersey Pinelands during the American Revolution. New Jersey's own civil war. A brutal civil war as was fought along the coast and in the Pinelands. Religious, political, and family connections combined entrepreneurial spirit and personal retaliation to create chaos at the Jersey shore. Uh, interestingly, patriots and loyalist fanatics along the Jersey shore continued to raid, fight, and kill each other until uh, 1783. Okay. I did something wrong. I can't. There we go. Sometime, Bob, I can't. Oh, okay. New Jersey's Atlantic coastline. Uh, as Joe introduced me, I have a, a certification as a social studies teacher in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. That allows me to teach history, geography, political science, economics, and social studies at the secondary level. So now I'm going to use it to do a little bit of geography. So if we take a look at the Jersey shore, it's about 130 mile coastline. Starting in the north, we have Sandy Hook, which is a five uh, mile sand spit uh, that today is a peninsula. Dur and interestingly, during the revolution, Sandy Hook was an island. There's two rivers up there, the Navasink and the Shrewsbury. And again, during the revolution, those two rivers flowed directly into the ocean. Today, they've been cut off and they flow uh, up into behind Sandy Hook. For the next 25 miles, we have what are called the highlands uh, from the Jersey highlands to uh, Bayhead, which is about a 25 mile uh, bit of land. At the highlands, uh, they go up to almost 350 feet and if you've ever been up in that area, one of the things to visit, if you haven't been, are the twin lights at the top of the 350 uh, part of the highlands. And this area is uh, mainland. And this is where the towns of uh, Asbury Park, Belmar, uh, Spring Lake, uh, Seagirt are. The la largest part of the Jersey Shore, going from Bayhead down to Cape May, about 95 miles are the barrier beaches. And uh, just to go back up in the Highlands, uh, Bayhead, there's two rivers up there, the Manasquan and the Shark. And on the barrier beaches, we know they range in uh, width from anywhere from 500 yards to a couple of miles. Uh, and in there are a number of, behind them are the bays. And in this area, again, are four rivers the Toms River, Forked River, Mullica, and Great Egg Harbor Rivers. One of the reasons I'll mention these rivers as we go along, uh, they play an important part in uh, what goes on. My next part of the geography is, let's take a look at the Jersey Pine Barrens themselves. So in this green shaded area are the uh, New Jersey Pinelands. And this is in adjacent to the coastline. It takes up 1.1 million acres of the Jersey coastal plain and it's called the Pinelands, also known as the Pine Barrens. And it makes up approximately 22% of New Jersey's area. So this is uh, where our pine robber phenomenon takes part. A little bit about the political makeup of New Jersey back at this time. At the start of the American Revolution, there were only 13 counties. There are uh, 20, 
one today. So the original 13 counties were broken up to make the additional counties. At the time of the American Revolution, New Jersey's Atlantic Coast and Pinelands were composed of four counties, Monmouth, Burlington, Gloucester, and Cape May counties. Uh, as you see, Atlantic County wasn't formed until 1837 and Ocean County in 1850. Of these four counties, Monmouth, it was the largest in population and due to its location with regards to New York City, it was the most prosperous. So a lot of the uh, fighting between individuals, the loyalists and the uh, patriots take place in Monmouth. Let's take a look at the uh, demographics at the outset of the War of Independence. So the total population of the colony of New Jersey or sometimes known as the province of New Jersey there were about 120,000 people, of whom 52% were males. Uh, slaves made up between 7 to 8%, mostly located in East Jersey. Today, we would call that North Jersey. And it's estimated, estimated that there were about 200 Native Americans still living in Jersey at the time of the revolution, with uh, 60 living in a reservation was known as Brotherton. Uh, today, Indian Mills or uh, close to Shemong. New Jersey's population was one of the most diverse of the 13 colonies with regards to religion, national origin, and economic status. So New Jersey was very diverse. A small, diverse, prosperous colony, largely dependent on its neighbors for eternal commerce, Jersey was a reluctant rebel that in reality had no substantive quarrel with Britain. So just like our name says, the Garden State, New Jersey at the time of the revolution was mainly a uh, place where produce was made and sold to the Philadelphia or New York area. So they really weren't dependent on anything or needed things from England. Throughout the war, while the Whigs exercised control over the inland <coughs> areas of Monmouth and Burlington counties, uh, they had little influence over the coastal townships. And again, uh, Whigs is a synonym for the Patriots. Now, what was New Jersey's feeling towards independence? A large segment of Central Jersey's population either opposed independence, and they were known as loyalists or the disaffected, or a large group were neutral. They didn't take sides. Uh, a lot of those were the uh, Quakers. Exemplified in this description is, comes from a man named Joseph Cogill from Gloucester County. I was as good a Whig as ever sat on a pot until independency was declared. And because <laughs> Joe said that, he was fined for seditious words. And going back to my days at Trenton State, uh, we were in my U.S. History One. We were told there were one third patriots, one third loyalists, one third neutral. Uh, historians over the since 1964, when I first had U.S. History One, uh, they've kind of changed this, and that the loyalist group was probably anywhere from 15 to 20 percent, not the one third that they originally were talking about. Now, uh, again, going back to geography, one of the most important places during this period with the pine robbers was Sandy Hook, or as it was known to the Patriots, the Hook were Horse Thieves Resort. Sandy Hook, 1780. And as I told you uh, earlier, Sandy Hook at this time was an island. And you see, this is the Navasink River, and this is the Shrewsbury River. They flow into the uh, Atlantic. And this is Sandy Hook at present. As I said, it, today it's a peninsula. And those two rivers, this is where they flow. They flow back into here as opposed to directly into the ocean like they did during this time. And as I said, at the time of independence, it was an island. The Sandy Hook Lighthouse began operations in 1764. Sandy Hook, the center of operations for British and loyalists at the Jersey Shore. Sandy Hook was the only place in New Jersey that the British controlled 
for the entire war. They took it over in 1776 and held it to 1783. Aside from protecting New York Harbor for the British Navy and merchantmen, it was a safe haven and a trading post for a diverse group of loyalist partisans who raided and terrorized the surrounding countryside. Interestingly, the present day Sandy Hook Lighthouse is the same one constructed in 1764. The uh, uh, Patriots tried to take the lighthouse and at the base, those walls are six feet thick. They were firing cannonballs at it and they were just bouncing off. So they, they wanted to destroy the lighthouse. They couldn't do it. So who operated from Sandy Hook? The area adjacent to Sandy Hook was to experience the, an almost unique activity of black and white loyalist refugees banding together to raid and plunder patriots. In one case, under the leadership of a black runaway slave who was known as Colonel Ty. Uh, an example of these raids is found in the New Jersey Gazette. About 50 Negroes and refugees landed at Shrewsbury and plundered the inhabitants of nearly 80 head of cattle about 20 horses and a quantity of wearing apparel and household furniture. They also took William Brindley and Elihu Cook, two of the inhabitants. So this was from the New Jersey Gazette of July, 1779. And even though he wasn't mentioned, uh, Colonel Ty led this raid. And uh, again, they took these things to Sandy Hook uh, the British would buy them off him and send it up to New York City. The war in this area is called the War of Retaliation or Lex Talionis. And the guiding principle here is whereby a punishment resembled the offense committed in kind and de degree. So basically, this is the biblical an eye for an eye. So we're going to see many times how this takes place. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some of the well, well, skirmishing along the Jersey Shore after 1777, except for the Battle of Mon Monmouth, 78, the attack at Chestnut Hill uh, Neck in October of 1778, that was the massacre of the Pulaski Legion, or the Battle of Springfield, June of 1780, rarely did British or regular or continental troops meet in battle. Occasionally, the Continentals were used on guard duty, but were often criticized as being ineffective. Uh, the governor pleaded with Washington to send troops to Monmouth County to protect them from these raiders. Uh, some troops were sent, but again, they really didn't do anything. Towns most affected by the fighting were Shrewsbury, Middletown, Tinton Falls, and Tom's River. However, no area along the coast was immune to attacks and or raids, particularly by irregular loyalist forces. They were known by different names, refugees, the banditti, or pine robbers. Some <clears throat> of the fiercest fighting along the Jersey Shore occurred after the British surrender at Yorktown. Many historians cite the Battle of Springfield, Bergen County, June 23, 1780, as the last battle of the war in New Jersey. But along the coast, patriots and loyalists continued to raid, fight, and kill each other until 1783. I would mentioned that right at the beginning. The main participants in this war of retaliation were the Association of Monmouth Retaliators and the Associated Loyalists. So the Monmouth Association of Retaliation was organized in 1780. Uh, the leader of it was this gentleman, Brigadier General David Foreman. A little bit about David Foreman. He was a controversial Whig from Monmouth County. He served as a regimental commander with the New Jersey militia and was also appointed a colonel in the Continental Army. And he was a leader of the radical Whigs in Monmouth County forming the retaliators. Uh, the controversy surrounded him in that he was involved in executing loyalists with uh, really drumhead trials. Uh, later on, he was accused of fixing elections so that his followers were elected to offices in Monmouth County. And uh, he owned salt works. Remember, New, during the revolution, New Jersey couldn't get salt because salt used to come up from 
the uh, Caribbean. So New Jersey started their own salt works and David Foreman owned a salt works on the coast. And those continental soldiers that were ser- sent to uh, protect the Americans, he used them to as labor on his uh, salt uh, works. As for the Loyalist group, it is the Board of Associated Loyalists. It was organized in 1781 by this gentleman, uh, Governor William Franklin. I guess everybody knows he is the illegitimate son of Benjamin Franklin. Now, the Board of uh, Associated Loyalists were formed in New York City. Franklin was the head. Uh, King George approved this group. Uh, He offered them, if you stick it out, I'll give you 200 acres of land. And they were supposed to uh, begin raids, but against strictly military targets. However, as the war went on, we talked about the retaliation. Uh, They were angry over what was happening to some of their brethren. And so they began to attack the homes and lands of uh, civilian uh, patriots. Here's an example of Lex Talionis. Here is a marker, and this is what is said on this stone marker. To perpetuate the memory of Captain Samuel Allen, organizer and leader of a regiment of volunteer Minutemen of the New Jersey coast. During the Revolutionary War, 1775 to 1783, This stone marks the spot where Captain Allen executed six Tories and their chief. Their chief was named Captain Ty. I I spell this out. This wasn't the uh, black leader Colonel Ty. This is a different Ty. And this monument was erected by the Allen descendants placed by Governor Livingston chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution in 1927. And if you want to go look at this marker, if you're on Route 70, just as you're coming up to the uh, Brielle Bridge, uh, you're heading south, uh, going over the Manasquan, off into the grasslands off to the side, you'll see this marker. To me, it's amazing that, you know, everything we talk about today, can you imagine uh, raising, uh, putting up a monument to somebody who just offhand killed uh, six of his prisoners. One of the reasons that uh, Sam Allen, who was a cousin to Ethan Allen, that he uh, was kind of ornery was the loyalists that he ended up executing uh, burned his house down three different times. And he was taken prisoner, sent to New York, and then he was exchanged. So he got his revenge on his tormentors. Now, who were the most notorious of the loyalist raiders? We're going to talk about um, six of them. Jake Fagan, Stephen Emmons, Louis Fenton, William Giberson, Joe Mulliner, and John Bacon. Governor Livingston offered rewards up to $500, sometimes listed as 500 pounds, for their capture. So um, these became wanted fugitives. Now, before I go into this, uh, this David Fowler, his... Uh, doctoral dissertation from Rutgers, the agrarious, egregious villains, wood rangers, London trade. This is the book on uh, pine robbers. Uh, you can get it online. Uh, when I first started doing research on this, the only place I could find it was on a film strip at the uh, David Library. Since then, I've I have copies of it that I got online. Now what? That's Fowler, how does he describe these pine robbers? Most pine robbers were poor, landless young men with little stake in society, hoped to improve their economic status through land piracy. The failure of the British to effectively rally, lead, and support their loyalist allies was a significant factor in their failure to win the war. By 1777, those with more questionable motives joined the pine robbers. So one of the reasons that uh, William Franklin's group, the Loyalist Association, is because the leaders of the British Army, Clinton, Howe, earlier, they really didn't like the Loyalists. New Jersey had, the New Jersey Volunteers was one of the largest Loyalist regiments in the uh, British Army, but basically uh, the British really didn't treat the Loyalists the way they thought they should have been treated. 
The pine robber phenomenon was centered in Southern Monmouth and Northern Burlington counties, particularly in Stafford, Dover, and Little Egg townships. Uh, there were no pine robbers, interestingly, in Cape May or Gloucester County. It would be safe to say that during the Revolutionary War, no other forest region was afflicted by fugitive political dissenters, guerrillas, or criminals as frequently or as long as in the Jersey Pine Barrens. Up north in Sussex County, there was a man named uh, James Moody, who was the equivalent of a pine uh, robber up in the uh, forest up there, but uh, it was not anywhere near like it was taken, uh, how they acted in the, the Southern Jersey and the Southern Pines. The first pine robber I'm gonna I'll talk about is Jacob Fagan. Fagan came from Shrewsbury Township. In May of 1776, along with a relative, accused and indicted for petty larceny for stealing clothing in New Hanover Township, it's Burlington County. They were found guilty and received 20 lashes as a punishment. So I guess they were discouraging, I guess what we call today shoplifters. And uh, I guess this is what led Fagan to uh, turn against the Patriot cause. In December of 1777, he enrolled in the 2nd Battalion of the New Jersey Volunteers, <coughs> one of the leading uh, Loyalist regiments. August of 1778, he was detached to go recruiting in Monmouth County. This was the start of his activities as a notorious refugee banditti. Fagan gang members included Stephen Emmons, also known as Burke, Stephen West, Ezekiel Williams, and a man named John Van Kirk, also known as Smith. The interesting thing was Van Kirk was a Whig mall. He was a plant. Uh, in September of 1788, Emmons, uh, Fagan, along with Emmons, uh, Williams, and Van Kirk, who was, uh, who, as I said, was the infil infiltrator, he was the mall, they attacked the home of Captain Benjamin Dennis. Uh, Captain Dennis, uh, this lived, was up in the Allenwood area, uh, not far from where Captain Allen had executed those other loyalists. And uh, it seems that uh, Fagan had uh, animosity towards Captain Dennis. So they decided they were gonna rob his house. But when they got there, only the captain's wife, her name was Hannah, and his daughter, 14-year-old uh, daughter, Amelia, were at home. The men ransacked the house. They didn't find any money. They got very angry, and they decided to hang Mrs. Dennis. They took her out and hung her from a uh, cedar tree. And uh, Van Kirk, the uh, wig mall, he kind of talked them into leaving before she actually died. Uh, the daughter, she ran away and she saw a neighbor coming in a cart, uh, she, in a wagon, uh, she jumped in it, they fired at her, uh, missed, and then after they left, they went back and uh, saved her mother. As a matter of fact, the mother and daughter both survived. The daughter, Amelia, uh, she wrote an account of this and in a number of histories of Monmouth County you can read Amelia's uh, description of what happened. The next night they decided to return, but Van Kirk warned Captain Dennis that they were coming back. And instead uh, the militia under Captain Dennis set up an ambush and Fagan and Emmons fled, but Fagan was shot and mortally wounded. Uh, he died in the woods and they originally buried him in the woods, but that wasn't enough punishment. Fagan's body was hung in a gibbet near Monmouth County Courthouse. So here's a representation of what they did. They dug his body up out of the woods, brought it to Freehold, and hung him in this gibbet. And here's a newspaper description of what happened. About 10 days ago, Jacob Fagan, who, was, who having previously headed a number of villains in Monmouth County that committed divers. Now, in colonial times, revolutionary times, they didn't put an E at the end of diverse. So I, you know, I have a tendency to pronounce it as divers, but it's really diverse. Robberies and were a terror of travelers 
was shot, since which his body has been gibbeted on the public highway in the county to deter others from perpetrating like detestable crimes. And this was in the New Jersey Gazette from October 1st, 1778. Now the end of the Fagan gang. On, in January 1779, Stephen Emmons, uh, Stephen West and Ezekiel Williams were led into another ambush. All three were killed. Uh, supposedly they were surrendering. They asked for quarter, but they weren't given it. Their bodies were taken to Monmouth Courthouse and were exposed to the elements just like Fagan's. And here is a drawing of the Monmouth County Courthouse. Near this courthouse, as many as 13 loyalists were hung uh, on the road be between Colts Neck and uh, downtown Freehold, they used to hang the loyalists. And again, basically without trials. So this law of uh, Lex Talionis played, as I said, played a very important role. The next uh, pine robber up in this area is Lewis Fenton, another refugee banditti. Lewis Fenton was a blacksmith from Freehold, New Jersey. His first run-in with the law, he was like his fellow banditti, Jacob Fagan, accused of stealing clothes from a tailor shop. So uh, I guess this is the way you replace clothes. So they knew who did it. So they told them either give the clothes back or uh, you're going to be arrested and sent to jail or maybe get whipped like Fagan did. He decided to return to close and he enclosed a note. Let me read the note. I have returned your damn rags. In a short time, I am coming to burn your barns and houses and roast you all like a pack of kittens. So uh, Fenton was not a nice man. Uh, most likely the only refugee banditti who was not either formally or informally associated with the British. We saw Fagan was a member of the second New Jersey Volunteers. June 5th, 1779, the beginning of his notorious career. He was accused of leading an ambush that killed Major Dennis in retaliation for the death of Fagan. So as I said, an example, uh, an example of Lex Talionis. So Captain Dennis had been promoted to a major uh, and uh, they said, and Fenton had ties with Fagan and he led this ambush. And then on June 21st, uh, he was accused of a robbery in Upper Freehold. However, on July 31st, 1779, his most infamous deed led uh, an attack in Old Yellow Meeting House in Upper Freehold Township. He was accused of killing an elderly couple, the Fars, and shooting and wounding their daughter. So again, these Far, uh, Mr. Far, he was uh, a tax collector. And so they figured he must have a lot of money in his house. And so the gang went there again, they couldn't find it. And in retaliation, they ended up killing this elderly couple and wounding the daughter. Governor Livingston issued a decree offering a reward of 500 pounds for Fenton and three to 200 pounds reward for unknown gang members who took part in this uh, far attack. September 4th, four members of his gang were captured by the militia. Now the ambush of Fenton, as I have here, a depiction of the ambush of Fenton, September 23rd, 1779. Fenton met his end when he was ambushed by a group of Light Horse Harry Lee's dragoons. So these were uh, Continental soldiers. Remember I said uh, Washington agreed to send some Continentals there to be on guard duty to help out the militia with these pine robbers. And uh, one of the groups sent was Light Horse Harry Lee's dragoons. A young man, he was only 18 years old, uh, William Van Matter, uh, he was taking uh, goods in his father's uh, wagon, and he was robbed by the Fenton gang. They robbed him, they smacked him around a little bit and uh, told him, you know, keep quiet or next time we're gonna kill you. Well, Van Matter got mad. He went and found the, uh, went to the headquarters where the dragoons were and a group led by a sergeant 
decided they were going to set up an ambush. What they did, they they hid under uh, hay in the back of the cart. So Van Matter went out again in the same place. Uh, Fenton saw him, he approached the uh, wagon. And as he got near it, the uh, soldiers jumped up and shot him down. Uh, interestingly, he had some of his gang hiding in the woods. When they heard the shots, they figured, oh, uh, Fenton you know, killed the uh, kid. But in return, so they came running out and the soldiers uh, ambushed them as well. So with the death of Fenton, things are going to change. The elimination of Jacob Fagan, Lewis Fenton, and most of their accomplices did not single, signal the end of marauding and relating to criminal related criminal activity. Burglaries, highway robberies, horse thievery, and other felonies continued to be committed throughout the war. Even though Governor Livingston, now this is interesting, again, going back to Lex Talionis, the proclamations offered rewards for apprehending and securing in jail. Uh, but no one complained in the Patriot camp when the offenders were killed. These weren't uh, dead or wanted dead or alive posters. They were supposed to be taken and brought to jail, and then you would get your reward. Uh, on the contrary, Whig authorities, the New Jersey legislature initiated special legislative measures to assure that ambushers would receive numer remuneration and at the same time encourage similar acts. So again, this again turned into one to dead or alive. So whether you brought the uh, guilty people back alive or dead, you're still gonna get your reward. The focus of gang activity moved further south to more remote Dover, Stafford and Little Egg and Galloway townships in the uh, really the heartland of the Pines. So Fagan and uh, Edmonds and these gangs operated on the fringes more towards uh, the central Burlington County where the pines are there, but not as heavy as they are further south. Egg Harbor, Barnegat Bay's most notorious pine robbers. William Giberson, he operated in the Little Egg Harbor area. Joe Molinor referred to as the Robin Hood of the pines. He operated along the Mullica River. And John Bacon, ro pine robber and privateer operated in the area of Barnegat Bay. And he was considered to be the most notorious, notorious and the last of the pine robbers. So here we have a 1795 map of New Jersey. And it's interesting here, they have extensive forests of pine. So again, this is the area where they're moving south. So the original pine robbers or banditti uh, act of, were up here. And then after 1779, they move into the central uh, Pineland area. William Giberson Jr., Joseph Molinar, and John Bacon had their headquarters hideouts deep within the Pinelands. Michael Adelberg. Now, as I said, David Fowler, who wrote his dissertation on the Pine Robbers, uh, Michael Adelberg, if you have anything you ever wanted to learn about the Revolutionary War in uh, Monmouth County, Adelberg is the man to go to. He said the pine robber gangs of Lower Shore found ample lairs and sparsely populated swamps and coves and were supported by disaffected shore villagers. They were never conclusively defeated, though most of their visible leaders did meet bloody ends. So let's start with Joseph Gibbardson Jr. The Gibbersons were of Dutch ancestry, ancestry. The original spelling of their name was. Giberson. William had two brothers and seven sisters. William was raised in Monmouth County's Upper Freehold Township, Allentown, New Jersey, and the family also had land in Burlington County near Crosswicks. So these were on the fringe areas of the Pines. Early in 1776, the Giberson family, who remained loyal to the Crown, were penalized by the Whig government in Monmouth. William's first run in with authorities was in 1778 when he was indicted for going into and returning from enemy lines. That is Philadelphia. Remember during this period before they left, the British controlled Philadelphia. And so basically what probably what happened, 
they brought uh, food and supplies to the British in Philadelphia. So that was a crime. And the area that we're talking about uh, where they're, they're from. So here's Crosswicks, here's Allentown. So this is the area that the uh, Giberson family was originally from. Now, what was his career as a pine robber? Again, here's a rep, we don't have any pictures or drawings of the pine robber, so I put representations. In February of 1779, the Giberson family property, both real and personal, were being confiscated by the Whigs. William Jr., he lost uh, 99 pounds in personal property. Uh, in 7, December 1780, the following criminal indictments, uh, he went off to Sandy Hook. Again, this is where most of the loyalist banditti refugees went to. In 1781, in August, Governor Livingston offered a reward of $200. So again, sometimes they represent it as pounds, other times as dollars for the capture of William Guyberson. So again, I put a sick because this is how they spelled it for various uh, atrocious offenses. So diverse robberies, thefts, and felonies. In December of 1781, he was indicted in Burlington County for waging war against the state, taking persons subjects to the state, that's kidnapping, aiding and abetting loyalist forces, entering the service of the king and other hostile acts. June of 1782, he was indicted in Monmouth County for horse stealing. Following these indictments, uh, he moved his base of operations to Little Egg Harbor slash Clamtown. Clamtown was one of the names of Tuckerton, New Jersey, where there were a significant number of disaffected. Again, disaffected were people who sided mainly with the British. Uh, here are some of the facts and legends of the Giberson's activities. In June of 1782, at the Falklandberg Tavern, this is around Tuckerton, Giberson's gang was drinking with smugglers. They were having a good old time. The Manahawkin militia were marching to arrest them. They had word that these uh, pine robbers were in this tavern. Giberson was given a warning and they set up an ambush for the militiamen. They chased the militia away. They re then returned to tavern to continue their drunken revel. And I'm taking the, uh, that from directly from one of the books describing their folklore. In July of 1782, uh, Giberson was indicted for the crime of high treason. In August of 1782, along with a gang member named Henry Lane, they were tracked down and according to militiaman Benjamin Bates, he shot and captured him. Henry Lane was also taken. And this militiaman, uh, he was, after the war, he was trying to get a uh, pension from the Continental Army or from New Jersey militia. And this was his story of how he captured the pine robber. The interesting thing was uh, Giberson, when uh, Bates first got the drop on him, uh, supposedly the story is Giberson pulled that old trick where he said, hey, what's that behind you? And Bates turned around and Giberson ran away. But uh, a couple of days later, Bates was able to track him down again, and this time took him prisoner. Uh, he Significantly, he was held as a state prisoner, not a prisoner of war. Therefore, he was not eligible for prisoner exchange. And when he heard this, he realized most likely he was going to be hanged. In October of 1782, with the help of one of his uh, sisters, he was able to escape from the Burlington County Jail. Supposedly what had happened was, and remember he had seven sisters. So when he was convicted and he was gonna be executed, he asked if his family could come to visit. And one of his sisters supposedly who uh, was kind of like him in build, build and what have you, they changed clothes in his prison cell and he walked out dressed as his sister uh, she was laying in the bed covered up with uh, a blanket so the guards didn't see this. And most likely when he escaped, he made his way to Sandy Hook in New York City. At the end of the war, the entire Giberson family joined 
the Loyalist exodus to Canada, and he took up residence in Nova Scotia. Interestingly, William was the only leader of a pine robber gang who was not killed by the Patriots because he escaped execution. And all the stories, they never said whatever happened to the sister if they uh, put any punishment on her for abandoning his escape. All right, let's turn to another pine robber from the Deep Pines, Joe Molinar, who is known as the Robin Hood of the Mullica. And he is also known as the dancing pine robber. He liked to have a good time. And the area that uh, he was going to work out of is along the Mullica River. Uh, here's Great Bay, Chestnut Neck, uh, the forks of the river. So this was the area of his operation, Pleasant Mills, Sweetwater, um, and Mordecai Swamp. The ironic thing is in this same area operated many of the uh, New Jersey uh, Whig or Patriot privateers. So both the uh, Pine Robbers, the Loyalists and the uh, Patriot privateers operating from the same area. Joe Molinar, fact and legend. Joseph or Joe Molinar is the only Pine Robber who most likely was born in England. His family settled in Little Lake Harbor Township. Before the revolution, he was uh, known, he was a mariner, a sailor. The first serious notice of Molnar came in September of 1780 when he was charged in Burlington in that Joseph Molnar, that's how they spelled his name, uh, mariner, assaulted John Wood, did beat and ill treat him. They didn't say why he did it. Molnar's pine robber gang consisted of about 10 core members with associates bringing it to a high around 40 members. One of their main activities was kidnapping Whig leaders, taking them to New York and holding them for either ransom or for prisoner exchange. Uh, charged by Burlington County Court with a number of kidnappings, but never accused of murder. This is one of the reasons that uh, he becomes a folklore uh, legend and kind of a, like a anti-hero. This seemed to reinforce the legend that even with all his many crimes, he, excuse me, he never committed murder. In either June or July of 1781, he was captured. He was first sent to Freehold, which is in Monmouth County, and then uh, transferred to Burlington where he was under indictment for a more serious crime. If you go into up around up the Mullica to where the Sweetwater Casino is, uh, up in that area, this is where he operated, and you can find this uh, marker Indian Mill Cabin Inn. Joseph Molnar, noted refugee Tory outlaw, was captured here in 1781. And in 1861, it was named the Union Hotel. And I took that picture. Okay, what? happened to Joseph Molinar. At a special court lately held in Burlington, a certain Joseph Molinar of Egg Arbor was convicted of high treason and is sentenced to be hanged this very day. This fellow had become a terror of that part of the country. He had made a practice of burning houses, robbing and plundering all who fell in his way, so that when he came to trial, it appeared the whole country, both Whigs and Tories, were his enemy. Again, New Jersey Gazette, uh, August of 1781. Now, at his trial for treason in July, he was supposedly, he supposedly produced his commission as a captain in the association. Uh, so the uh, William Franklin group. And also he had a letter of mark that said he was a privateer. So both the Americans gave out letters of mark uh, for their privateers, and he said he had one from the British. But the uh, court refused to admit them as evidence, and he was tried, convicted, and hung in Burlington City at Gallows Hill. Today, that's Laurel Hill Cemetery. And as you read the newspaper article or the, the story, it seems like he was tried, convicted, and hung on the same day. So uh, you didn't get to sit around in jail wondering if you can appeal your conviction. So Molinar was hung in Burlington. 
Now we turn to our last pine robber, Captain John Bacon, the terror of Barnegat Bay. He was both a privateer and a pine robber. And here's a nice uh, aerial view of uh, Barnegat Bay. So, and as I said, he's the most notorious of it. Bacon was born in Arney Town in Burlington County on the fringe of the, fringe of the Pinelands. He moved to Stafford Township in Monmouth County at that time, now it's Ocean County, where he was married and worked as a shingle maker for his father-in-law. Remember the cedar in the uh, Pinelands, the cedar makes very good uh, shingles. So this was a job that he had for his father-in-law. Bacon ranged over a wide ter wider territory than any of the other pine robbers, including the townships of Springfield, Northampton, Little Egg Harbor in Burlington County, Dover and Stafford in Monmouth. His favorite haunts in these townships included Clamtown or Tuckerton, Waretown, Manahawkin, Barnegat, West Creek, Cedar Creek and Wading River. Mostly due to his mobility, he was active for about two years longer than any of the other pine robber leaders. If you look back at their careers, maybe a year or so, uh, they were either caught or uh, executed. He hung around for two years. While referred to as a captain, as referred to as Captain Bacon, there's no documentation of a commission from the British. He was involved in what has been called the London trade. Uh, that is Jersey loyalists and neutrals traded with the British in New York City, selling local produce for either specie, that would be coin or luxury goods. Unlike Giberson and Molinar, who he most, likely knew, he most likely knew them, he inspired no folklore legend. So, you know, Molinar was the dancing uh, bandit and or the uh, Robin Hood of the Pines, but probably because of so many murders that were attributed to uh, Bacon, the locals really didn't put him up uh, in the folklore area. His career, July 1780, he was indicted in that he did voluntarily and unlawfully go over to the enemy held in New York without a passport. Remember earlier, uh, Giberson was that when he went into Philadelphia. In December of 1780, his first serious act, the killing of Lieutenant Joshua Stutson off of Tom's River. Uh, Stutson was a lieutenant with the New Monmouth militia. Now, what happened was Bacon was in New York. Uh, three of these men who were, they weren't, weren't loyalists, they were neutrals. They had been in New York and they had sold goods there, probably brought produce. And when they were heading back to New Jersey, uh, Bacon stopped them and uh, got in the boat with them. When they were coming back, the Monmouth militia off of Tom's River uh, saw them. They ordered them to stop. Bacon thought they were after him. He fired and he killed Lieutenant Stutson. So that was his first major act where you know, you know he actually killed someone. In May of 1781, he began plundering homes in Burlington County. And then he returned to the shore townships, attacking, plundering patriots, particularly militiamen uh, in the uh, Forked River, Waretown area. Now where he killed uh, the uh, Lieutenant, whoop, I have to go back. If you look at, This, the, the, the sound, this is Barnegat. And I always wondered this until I start doing this, you know, Tom's River, when you study the revolution, even colonial New, uh, New Jersey, Tom's River was a big place for uh, a port. And I always used to wonder where they all went all the way down to Barnegat Inlet. But up until 1882, there was a thing called the Cranberry Inlet or the New Inlet that was right off the Tom's River. So it was a short trip across the bay and up to New York. And as I have here in 1812, there was a hurricane. It closed the inlet. And today where the Cranberry Inlet is, is the uh, town of Ortley Beach. 
So uh, the weather uh, has changed New Jersey's coastline. Again, the sound, that's Barnegat Bay. Pine robber gang ambushed militiamen in Manahawkin in December of 1781. So basically, New Year's Eve, Bacon and his gang were in a tavern in Manahawkin. These pine robbers like to hang in taverns. The militia was informed, and also was Bacon. Someone told them the militia are coming after you. He set up an ambush and killed one of the militiamen as a result of killing a militiaman. Uh, he already killed one up further north. He was indicted for high treason. And here's a marker that you can read up in Manahawkin. On this ground, Captain Reuben Randolph led Manahawkin Militia Company 5, 2nd Monmouth, against a force of British loyalists that was twice as large and commanded by the notorious Captain John Bacon. During the action, Lines Pangborn, Lines was his first name, was killed and fellow patriot Sylvester Tilton was seriously wounded. And it tells you that the uh, Board of Freeholders from Ocean County put this marker up. So uh, again, Manawak in Stafford Township, this is where he, remember he moved there uh, make as a shingle maker. Now, now we come to his most notorious action, the massacre of Long Beach Island. Massacre on Long Beach Island, October 25th, 1782, a British vessel ran aground near Barnegat City and was captured by Patriot militiamen under Captain Andrew Steelman. That night while sleeping on the beach, Steelman and his men were massacred by Tory raiders led by John Bacon. So if you go to the uh, Barnegat Lighthouse State Park, this monument is located right at the beginning of entrance to the park. And on Long Beach Island, if you go up to Ship Bottom, uh, they give another little description of action that took up uh, further north. So again, this is Long Beach Island, the story of the massacre. So where it took place, we see here, uh, Barnegat, well, remember at this time, there was no Barnegat Light. Barnegat Light was built in the 1800s. Uh, General, um, well, he was a major then, Meade from the Gettysburg. He was the engineer who built the Barnegat Light. But Barnegat Inlet, and this is basically where the uh, site of the massacre took place. A little bit of the story. For most of 1782, Bacon continued raiding the area of Barnegat Bay from Tom's River to Little Egg Harbor. Bacon used to visit the homes of well-known patriots with his raiders, taking whatever he wanted, money, food, clothing, at the muzzle of a musket or the point of a bayonet. On October 25th, a Dutch slash Belgian some stories, they say it's a Dutch ship. Other stories say it's a Belgian ship loaded with a cargo, mainly a thing called Heisen tea. This was a very popular tea, uh, and it was worth a lot of money. This ship ran aground off of Barnegat Inlet, and you see basically where it happened. The crew of around 25 men of the Patriot privateer Alligator led by a Captain Steelman, discovered the wreck and spent the day offloading the cargo, decided to spend the night on the island. When I was doing research on this and I read it, I said, I wonder why they named their ship the Alligator. We, we don't have any alligators in Jersey. And John Bacon, again, he had spies everywhere. Uh, he was informed of the events on the island. He had a crew of his uh, private here, it was a, really a galley, a whaleboat. It was called the Hero's Revenge. And late at night with only nine men, they attacked the sleeping Patriots. They ended up killing Captain Steelman and, uh, and about maybe 20 Patriots using mainly knives and bayonets. When the remainder of the crew of the Alligator who were aboard the ship just off the inlet, uh, they came to help. Bacon's men rode back to the mainland. And also some of the stories say why the crew of the uh, Captain Steelman's crew were killed so easily. 
that aside from the tea, they also found rum and other alcoholic beverages, and most likely they, they got drunk uh, unloading the cargo. Last skirmish of the Civil War, of the war in New Jersey. December of 1782, a group of Burlington County militia set out to capture John Bacon. They consisted of six cavalry commanded by Captain Richard Shreve, 20 infantrymen cap, uh, commanded by Captain Edward Thomas. They searched for Bacon as far as the shore. Without finding him, they decided to head back to Burlington. Along the way, the men stopped to rest at the Cedar Bridge Tavern, located very close to uh, the bridge over Cedar Creek. While they were in the tavern, Bacon and his men appeared on the other side of the bridge. As Captain Bacon and his men saw the militia, they barricaded Cedar Bridge and began their defense. Captain Shreve gathered the, uh, well, he was the cavalry guy, but they gathered the infantry and they began a full-scale attack. Just as they were about to overcome Bacon and his bandits, Local residents of Cedar Bridge unexpectedly came to Bacon's assistance, and John Bacon escaped. The locals surrendered uh, to the militia, and several were taken back to Burlington for trial. So one of the things, again, why these pine robbers were able to do as much as they did, uh, a lot of the people who lived there who weren't active loyalists, they supported these pine robbers because basically they helped the economy. Uh, the Patriots suffered several wounded and one killed. The man who was killed was a man named William Cook. Keep that name in mind. The Pine Robbers had one killed and several wounded, and John, including John Bacon. Now here is a Battle of Cedar Bridge uh, by Lewis Glansman. And here is the Cedar Bridge Tavern today. Restored Cedar Bridge Tavern, located on Old Halfway Road, Barnegat Township. The interesting thing is, in since the American Revolution, it looks like the Cedar Bridge Tavern still has the old outdoor facility. So, uh, I guess the things haven't changed that much since the Revolutionary time. And also, the Cedar Bridge Tavern is reenacted in December. Again, like everything else where the crossing isn't going to be reenacted, neither is the affair at Cedar Bridge. The hunt for John Bacon continues. A posse of six militiamen led by Captain Stewart came upon Bacon in the tavern in Parkertown. Again, this is down uh, around Tuckerton, between Tuckerton and Manahawken. A struggle between Stewart and Bacon ensued with Bacon asking for quarter. Remember, in those days, if you were get if you got tired in a fight, you can ask for a quarter. Now, John Cook, who was the brother of William, who was killed at Cedar Bridge, he came in the back door and bayoneted Bacon in the back. The wounded Bacon then tried to escape, but Captain Stewart shot him with his musket, uh, killing John Bacon. This happened on April 3rd, 1783. The militiamen took his body back to Jacobstown where they planned to bury him in the middle of the road so there would be no sign of his grave. So remember, the, we had the picture of uh, Fagan being gibbeted. What they wanted to do was bury him in the middle of the road. And there, again, this would be like uh, disgracing his body that nobody would ever find it. However, one of Bacon's bro uh, came and pleaded for the body and the militiamen, I don't know, they kind of felt sorry. They turned Bacon over to his brother and his body, and he was buried in a grave in Arneytown. This is called the Province Line Cemetery or Arneytown Cemetery, and it's supposed to be the uh, burial site of John Bacon. And it's located on Province Line Road, New Hanover Township. This was originally a Quaker site, so I'm assuming that Bacon was an lapsed Quaker, and his brother, when he got the body, buried him in the uh, Quaker Cemetery. Postscript, why the war in Central Jersey was so long and brutal. The British naval base at Sandy Hook gave Loyalists a more convenient depot for selling booty, receiving war materials, and receiving temporary refuge. 
No other place in New Jersey was occupied the British continuously throughout the war. Pine robber gangs of the lower shore found ample lairs in the pine swamps and coves and were supported by disaffected shore villagers. We talked about at Cedar Bridge, how they came to Bacon's uh, rescue. They were never conclusively defeated, although most visible leaders uh, met bloody ends. Retaliators maintained a cycle of retributive uh, violence against the loyalists and practiced terror against disaffected and alleged disaffected locals. So this animosity between, and again, basically between the civilians. And again, this is found in Michael Adelberg's American Revolution in Monmouth, page 145. Now I'm gonna give you a post postscript on the Revolutionary War in New Jersey. Sandy Hook, last British casualties in New Jersey, December 31st, 1783. Lieutenant Douglas, uh, Hamilton Douglas Halliburton led a party from the HMS assistance in pursuit of deserters. The barge in which they were using was caught in high seas capsized with all aboard either drowning or freezing to death. They are described on a memorial as 12 gentlemen and one common seaman. The original marble memorial was erected by Halliburton's mother, but was destroyed in 1808 by French sailors. Uh, the grave itself was found in 1908 and the bodies were reinterred in Cypress Hill Cemetery in New York City. The present memorial was erected in 1937. And here is the president memorial. So if you go to um, Sandy Hook and on around where that, on the inland side, you'll find this uh, Halliburton Memorial. You see the American flag, the British flag and the British Naval uh, Ensign. And that is the Halliburton uh, Memorial and the end of my presentation. If you had received one of the emails, I think I sent out some information and uh, here is a selected bibliography, leave it up for a while. Again, these are the books that I consulted. And if you're interested in folklore of New Jersey, these are the Henry Charlton Beck, his books, Jersey Genesis, Roads Home, uh, all from the 1930s. He did a tour of central South Jersey, different parts and his books uh, from Ru uh, Rutgers Prince are the things to go to. And as I have down here, if you're interested in anything about the revolution in New Jersey, Dennis Ryan's New Jersey in uh, American Revolution, a chronology goes day by day what happened in New Jersey during the Revolutionary War and David Mann's battles and skirmishes again they go by towns and they list every battle of skirmish that took place in New Jersey. And it comes both in booklet and you can get a big map uh, and it's placed on the map. So these are some of the bibliography. 